we've already sung a lot of really good things today. And like Paul was talking about, really it gets down to our heart. What is the, the, the real heart of worship? What's it all about? And uh, just so happened I want to talk about that today. And it's amazing how, you know, the people who's picking the songs and whoever's speaking don't necessarily uh, get together with each other. But the Lord is uh, working things out and he's orchestrating things and putting things on our hearts to do. And that, that's a great thing. Um, we're going to be looking in the fourth chapter of John, uh, the story about the Samaritan woman, the woman with the well. Has anybody ever heard that story? Yeah. You might, maybe in Sunday school, maybe it's uh, something we've covered in VBS. Is that right, Sharon, maybe? Or Kelly? We've covered the, the woman with the well in VBS. So it's, it's a real, something that, that we all know. And... Uh, I'm going to look at some uh, really important things in here, some things the Lord wants us to, to understand and, and put in effect in our lives. And let's, let's start by praying. Lord, we just thank you for today. Thank you for your word especially. And we just ask that you would open that to us, to our understanding, that it would go deep in our hearts and produce the fruit that you are looking for. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So we'll start with the... Uh, uh, chap John chapter 4 and starting verse 1 and I just want to read the first three verses we, okay uh, now, I'm sorry, first six verses now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing, baptizing more disciples than John, although in fact it was not Jesus who baptized but his disciples, so he left Judea and went back uh, once more to Galilee now he had to go through Samaria, so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down at the well. It was about noon. Okay, let's, let's go on to the next uh, set of verses there. Uh, when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me to drink? His disciples had gone to town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. And we look back and, well, why is that? Why did that come to be? Uh, the Jews really despised the Samaritans. And, uh, and then I know in BBS we did the story about the Good Samaritan, which was kind of a, uh, a slap in the face to those Jews who believed the Samaritans were no good. Uh, but how did, how did they get this, uh, uh, this uh, enmity between the two? Well, if we look back, I, I, I'm not, I don't have it on the screen there, but in, the first, in first Kings chapter 12, uh, that's during the time when Israel uh, rebelled against Rehoboam, which was Solomon's son who took over the kingdom. And uh, so this was back around 975 B.C., uh, Solomon had taken the throne uh, around 1014 B.C., and so now uh, he has done all the, you know, he's built the temple, he's done all the things he's, that he's done, and now uh, he has died. Rehoboam, his son, has taken over, 975 B.C., thereabouts. And uh, it's interesting what happens now. I'm going to read just a little bit out of this chapter. Uh, we don't have it up on the screen. Um, where uh, Jeroboam, I'll, I'll start in uh, 1 Kings 12, where the print gets smaller every year. Tw get the light. Get, no, that's right. Got tears there. Uh, 25. Then Jeroboam fortified Shechem in the hill country of Ephraim and lived there. From there he went out and built up Peniel. Jeroboam thought to, to himself, the kingdom will now likely revert to the house of David. If these people go up to the, offer sacrifices at the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem, they will again give their allegiance to their Lord, Rehoboam, king of Judah. Then they will kill me and return to King Rehoboam. After seeking advice, the king made two golden calves. He said to the people, It is too much for you to go to Jerusalem. Here are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. One he set up in Bethel, and the other in Dan, and this thing became a sin. The people went even as far as Dan to worship the one there. 
Jeroboam built shrines on high places and appointed priests from all sorts of people, even though they were not Levites. He instituted a festival on the 15th day of the eighth month, like the festival held in Judah, and offered sacrifice on the altar. This he did in Bethel, sacrificing to all to the calves he had made. And at Bethel, he also installed priests at the high places he had appointed, and so forth. So we see where this, where this division came from. Uh, we have a, a King Jeroboam now. The nation has split. Uh, Jeroboam took the top uh, ten nations, the ten tribes, and Rehoboam had the bottom, Judah and Benjamin. And so uh, where Rehoboam was in Jerusalem, they were going to stick with the law of God, and they were going to stick with uh, the Levite priests who would teach and officiate at the, at the temple. And God had already said, where I choose to put my name, that's where I want you to sacrifice. So all this that Rehoboam did, and um, I'm sorry, Jer what Jeroboam did uh, in Samaria, it was all against what God had commanded, totally against it. In fact, he then appointed priests of all kinds of people, of all sorts, all sorts of people uh, that were not Levites uh, to officiate and to make sacrifices that, of course, God was not going to honor. So this was, uh, and, and what happened was when uh, the Assyrians came in later, uh, that would have been at, uh, when God brought judgment on the northern tribes, do I have that date there? They, they came in later and uh, actually deported the people who were living in the northern tribes into to the east towards Babylon and other countries. And then they replaced them with their own people. So you had a real mix. There were still a few people left behind, the ones that weren't of any value to them. And so there was this mix, and there was a, a huge uh, change in how you worship God. Uh, in fact, one of the stories later on in, in First Kings uh, about the next chapter was when uh, the Lord had set lions among the people in, in judgment for them worshiping other gods. And so uh, their advice was, well, let's get one of these priests, who was not a Levite, let's get one of these Samaritan priests and bring him back and have him teach the people how to worship God. So they did. And so they learned to worship the Lord, and they also worshiped all the other gods. So there was this huge mixture uh, going on there. And so uh, down here, clear, clear down to Jesus' time, that's, that's where that animosity came from, from the Jews despising the Samaritans because they had got off track right from the start, right from the get-go. And what, they're, what they were doing in their worship wasn't, wasn't right, wasn't true. So that's where that rift came from. Um, and so this is hundreds of years that this has gone on. So let's go back to John, the uh, fourth chapter, on uh, verse 10. Let's go to verse 10. So she has asked him, uh, she's wondering what, how, how in the world he would ask her for a drink. You know, she's really pondering this. It doesn't make any sense to her. Well, Jesus answered her, her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would ask him and he would be given you, he would have given you living water. So the woman said, you have nothing to draw, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank it from it himself, as did also his sons and livestock? So uh, she's thinking of uh, just a purely physical thing. She's thinking, okay, I've been drawn out of this well, but now you're talking about living water, but it, you would have to have something to draw that water, just like I have to draw from this well. So she's not realizing that the living water he's talking about isn't Natural water is something else. And she notices that he has no way of doing that. Well, Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water, Jacob's well, will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become a, in them a spring of living water welling up to eternal life. So now he's, he's showing her that this water he's talking about not the one you're drawing that you have to draw every day because you get thirsty every day. But this water will satisfy that thirst in you, uh, that thirst for God, the thirst for righteousness. And this is a spring of water welling up to, it's going to take you somewhere to eternal life. That's uh, if, if you'd have just known who you were asking or who asked you for a drink, if you'd just known, uh, you'd have asked me and I'd given you this, that, that 
you don't you don't know about yet. So verse fifteen, the woman said to her to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. So she's she's really it, it, her heart's cry is, you know, she's 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 calling out to him, all right, I don't really understand what you're saying, but, but give me this. And Jesus said, he told her, go call your husband and come back. Now, we might often think at first reading this that he's just like, okay, I don't really want to answer that. I'm going to change the subject now, and I want you to go do something. And like, is he what, searching for time to come up with an answer? Absolutely not. He is, he, is, he is immediately giving her the living water that he's talking about. Immediately. You know, you know, the, what, when he says to go, call your husband and come back, she, her reply is, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. And so he is giving her, if, if you would look in 1 Corinthians, it talks about the gifts of the Spirit, and one of them is the word of knowledge. Uh, all the things that come from the Spirit of God, these are things that lead to eternal life. They're life-giving. And Jesus is, is giving this word of knowledge to her because he is giving her that well. It, he's, he's, that spring that of living water, he's immediately given that to her. He's letting her taste of it. And her response is, Sir, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worship on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place we must worship is in Jerusalem. You see, he goes back to that, what we just wrote about and read about in First Kings, that they'd gotten off track and they'd kept off track. And they weren't going to come back. And something that always bothered her, because she'd heard both sides of this, evidently, and she was bringing this up to him, well, since you're a prophet, maybe, maybe you could, you're a spokesman from God to us, and maybe you can answer this question. It's been bothering me that we've been taught to go bring sacrifice to these golden calves, to these men who aren't real priests, they're not Levites. And yet the Jews are telling us that we need to go worship and bring our sacrifices to the temple in Jerusalem. If you're a prophet, maybe you can help me settle this in my heart because it's in with me. It bothers me. And Jesus said, woman, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. Wow. To find out that all you have believed and done your whole life, and you're an adult, and you're, you're getting water for the man you're with, and to discover that, wow, all we're doing, we're worshiping something that we don't know. Wow. Has anybody had a time in your life when you realized what your, some of your beliefs, you realized they weren't right? that you needed to change, that the Lord shined some light down and you saw some, oh, oh, what I was doing, what I was believing, what I was thinking, that, that was wrong, that wasn't right. And so it, it had to hit her like a ton of bricks that, wow, we Samaritans are worshiping something that we don't know. He says, uh, you Samaritans worship what you do not know. We were speaking of the Jews. We worship what we do know. For salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and now and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and in truth. And so all the uh, things that e either side, either what the Samaritans are doing or what the Jews in Jerusalem were doing. It had to do with it had to do with what they thought of worshiping God. The Jews had it right; they were worshiping according to knowledge. And yet, even with that, of course, even with that, they still missed Jesus. They still uh, crucified him. 
But even with that, even if you got all the law right and done everything, all the sacrifices and offerings and all that stuff, they've done it all right, still, God is seeking those who worship him in spirit and truth. He was going to surpass. Even if they'd done everything correct and proper in Jerusalem, he has something, the next step for him. Something would far surpass anything you'd ever see going on at the temple. And he's opened this up to this woman who came just to do a daily task, just to get the water. He's going to pour this out. He's going to give her this water that she will that will cause her to never thirst again. Because the time not only the time had come right then that the Father's looking for those to worship Him in the Spirit and in truth. Spirit in the Holy Spirit worshiping Him, and I think we. We experience that a little bit sometimes when we're singing some of these songs, don't we? Like in your spirit, with the Holy Spirit, you are pouring your heart out to God. You're worshiping Him. Praise God. God wants to worship in spirit and in truth. Well, the woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When He comes, He will explain everything to us. And so, this really strikes home because in the mess that she'd been taught, she still knew there would be a Messiah. Even, even in this, standing before the golden calf and all the things that they would do, she still knew there would be a Messiah and that he was coming and he would set things straight. Wow. That some seed somewhere got planted. She knew Messiah was coming. And Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. To me. He said that to only, I think, one other person in the scripture that he came out and said that, that he was the Messiah. Hey, she asked for this living water. <laughs> and he was pouring it out to her. Absolutely changed her life that day. Just from that one encounter. So we'll go on. Verse 27, just then the disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked him, what do you want or why are you talking with her? Then leaving her water jar, the woman back, went back to the town and said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their uh, way toward him. And so I don't, you know, when we, uh, when the Lord draws us to Him, I, I know myself uh, in Germany in the army, uh, and and the Lord drew me to Him, and I repented that day and turned my life to Him, surrendered to Him. I wanted to tell people, <laughs> and you know, I didn't, uh, I didn't have all the answers. Um, I didn't, uh, I couldn't uh, at that time. I couldn't lead Him down the Roman road, right, right. You study in the, the scriptures. People, people know what that what, what that is, but I didn't have a set of scriptures to ha- how to lead somebody to Christ. I could tell them a little bit about the gospel. I just knew what what Jesus had done to me, and we talked about that a couple weeks ago about the testimony that God gives, gives all of us. And so uh, uh, I was just hey, you know, I was I was over here in the army, and God drew me to Himself. I repented. I Sent the letter to my wife, and neither one of us doing it knew either one was going to church. She's back in Selma, California, and uh, our letters had crossed the mail. We got them that next week, and saying how God had changed our hearts, and and uh, that I don't know if you're going to serve the Lord, but I'm going to, you know. And our letters kind of kind of said that, and of course we rejoiced when we got them. So I know that that kind of thing. That's part of my testimony, and I know that uh, I, I was sharing that with people. And uh, I, th- I think it was quite a few years that I could say it without tears. <laughs> Hard to say it now. Tears of joy. Tears of thank you, God. It's like I was at the well that day and I'm getting living water. But I would tell people, and, and I remember uh, there were three weeks in a row that uh, people in my, in my squad in the army that uh, the Lord would just speak to my heart said, invite that one to dinner. This would be on a Friday night. And so, okay, uh, so we lived off post, and so I would invite him to dinner. And uh, 
uh, Lou would make him a good, you know, biscuits and gravy and all that good stuff she made. And uh, she'd arm wrestle them too, and she'd beat most of them. And uh, <laughs> that's another story. <laughs> and anyway, uh, so I would just begin sharing with them about the Lord, what I knew, and, and it'd get to a point where they, they were wanting to repent. And, and so our pastor lived next door, so I'd run over maybe 10 or 11 at night, Pastor, this guy wants to give his life to the Lord, so he'd come over there, you know. And this went on for three weeks. And uh, he, he, I think he finally said to me, well, you need to learn a little bit more scripture because you can do this. You just need to learn a bit more of this, you know. But just even with my limited understanding, I knew God had done something tremendous in my life, a miraculous thing, and I wanted to share that with others. And so I didn't know all the scriptures and everything like I, like I do now, but uh, still, uh, like this Samaritan woman, she's going to go back to the town and tell everybody what, man, the Lord, he told me everything I ever did. So we have a zeal, don't we? That he gives us because we want to we want to share this. It's the best thing we've ever had. So, even though all the mess she was in, she still knew Messiah was coming. So, verse thir- uh, twenty-seven. Just then, his disciples returned and was surprised to find him talking with a woman. Oh, I read that, didn't I? But no one asked, "What do you want?" Um, let's see. Back down to verse thirty-one. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. So here we are, water that the Samaritan woman didn't know anything about, and now we have food that he wants to teach his disciples that they didn't really know anything about yet. In fact, he said, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Right? The Samaritans, what they're worshiping is not according to knowledge, and you don't know what this food is. Then his disciples said to each other, could someone have brought him food? Again, we, we tend to, like them, we tend to think on a, on a natural level. If you think about food, well, where's the biscuits, you know? Where's the, or where's the, what'd you make, banana bread or zucchini bread or something like that? <clears throat> Where is it, you know? Somebody bring him some of that? My food, Jesus said, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Wow. Think about that. That is spiritual food he's talking about. So we know the spiritual drink was him giving the Holy Spirit to abide in us, and that would bring a, a well of water flowing out of us that we'd never thirst again, we'd be satisfied. And now the food is to do the will of God and finish the work. That's the food. So we have something to eat and we have something to drink. Uh, verse 35, don't you have a saying, it's still four months and until the harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests the crop for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and the other reaps, is true. I sent you out to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work, and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. And so uh, we see that still today where uh, uh, you may get in a conversation with somebody and as, as they open up, I, I, I can't believe how many, I've been, I've been noticing in the last few weeks of how many people are just willing to share their life story. It's it just been amazing to me. You know, just if you spend time talking with people, they'll, they're going to come out with their life story. And uh, so... So many times you find there was a background where, yeah, as a kid, mom and dad took me to church. So you find there's some thread, some seed in there uh, that, you can, that you can work with. You can uh, identify with it. You can understand what, what they're talking about. And, uh, and you can be a friend to them. And you can talk to them about the Lord. And so a lot has gone on. Uh, he, when he sent his disciples out, there'd already been a lot of sowing of the of the word of God, in um, uh, down in Jerusalem, down in Judah, and and even up in Samaria. Samaria, they knew that uh, the Messiah was coming, 
And so he, he said, the hard work's been done. I'm going to send you out to tell these people about me and bring them into the kingdom. And so uh, someone sows, another reaps. But they all rejoice in the harvest. And we find that in our, in our neighbors. You, you, you know, look for the conversation. Get in a conversation with your neighbors and find that spot where they knew something about God or maybe, maybe they gave their life to the Lord and maybe they turned away. But find that uh, place and continue that work because the food that Jesus is talking about is uh, doing the will of God and finishing the work. And so that, that's food to us too. We're going to help work and finish God's work, uh, bring someone to, to, to their belief in God. That's a, that's a great thing. That's part of the work we have. That's food. Now, verse 39, many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So it's, uh, she didn't have a lot to say about Jesus, did she? She just talked about how he told me everything that I've ever done. And this this got to be the Messiah. Well, many of them believe just on her testimony. And, and you'll find that people will believe in the Lord on your testimony. They'll, they'll believe. They'll see that something happened to you. And as you share your testimony, they say, well, that was, that was God's hand in that. He brought the, that to pass. And so they will believe in God. So now, in verse 4, though, so when the Samaritans came to him, oops, okay, uh, I, I'll go back to 39. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything he ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just be because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man truly is the Savior of the world. And so she started something in them. Just from her testimony, they, they came to a belief in Christ. And yet then when they came to him and heard from him, then they were absolutely convinced. Now we don't believe just because of your testimony, but because we've heard him, and now we do believe he is the Savior of the world. So... Um, I want to encourage you to share with people your testimony. Uh, uh, not just when, how the Lord brought you to himself, but maybe other things uh, that happened. That you know, you know it was God. You know it was him answering prayer or him just intervening. Maybe you didn't even pray, but you know God uh, did something. I remember uh, the... Um, and this part, I don't know if I've shared this part of my testimony here, but when I grew up... Um, my, my mom and dad divorced when I was 10. That's when it started. And it, and it was finalized at 14. It was down in California. And the, um, back then, the, the wife pretty much got everything, you know, back in the California divorce laws back then. Uh, I think my dad had a better attorney or something, and he got everything. So all my mom had was uh, she could come for about a half hour or so, pick up some of her clothes, no furniture, thing, anything like that. And uh, she had about a half hour visit with my brother and I. My sister was uh, 10 at the time, they, and there was no visit with her. And, and then she was to have no contact with us, period. End of statement. And she was gone out of our lives. Uh, as, this, as, this, as if my dad had just taken out and shot her. I mean, that's about, you know, what happened. Well, uh, so, but I had grown up, my grandmother telling me, when they ask you at school about your mother, just say she's dead. And so that's how I was fed some things that weren't good in my life that I would have to overcome later. And uh, so that's when I was 14. I grew up just really hating my mother, resenting her. And uh, so the day that I fell on my knees and repented and turned my life to the God, to, over to the Lord, Guess what? The first thing he brought up to my mind was my mother. And I didn't have to struggle with, will God help me with this in my heart to get over this? He just took it, took it away. He took the hatred out of my heart and he put love in there, in this place, uh, like it had never been gone. And then my desire was, well, I need to tell my mother that I love her. I need to, I need to find her. I had no idea where she was at. She was not allowed to contact. 
And so uh, I wrote home. Uh, now my dad and my grandma, they didn't, uh, they still hated my mom, and uh, so my grandma, I think she turned the light, her house lights off for a whole week. She was so mad, you know, that I wanted to see my mother. And uh, so all, all this has been reconciled. There's more to the story, but my dad, my grandma, it, things got reconciled because God does like to finish his work. He doesn't like things undone. So if he finishes what he starts in people, even if it's right to the end, where things are finally made right, He'll finish it. So um, I remember, and then I got out of the army, I came back, and started looking for my mom. Couldn't, couldn't, there was no, there was no uh, uh, internet. You know, you could go to the post office and see if their mail was forwarded. You know, and I just missed her um, uh, by just months of her last forwarded address. And so we went to her family reunions, to funerals, and her brothers and sister had. I had no idea what happened to her uh, or where she was. I found out she got remarried. Um, anyway, uh, and then one day, uh, yeah, I was still in the Army, and I had a dream one night. And in the dream, my mom was sitting, kind of almost like a, in a church pew, and she was just smiling. She was of her right mind and, and uh, just real happy. And I woke up the next morning, and I thought, that... God, that's God let me know I'm going to get to see my mom. I'm going to get to tell her I love her. And so I, I kept that in my heart. I had to hate keep it there for about 13 years. But I came home, looked for her, couldn't find her. Nobody knew where she went. And so uh, one day um, I was in my garden. Of course, I've, I like the garden. And I looked up, the, I'm down in California, looked at the sky, and I saw big clouds up there. And I said, well, Lord, I know you gave me that dream. I know, I know it. I know that's from you. I know I'm going to get to see my mother. And uh, yet we're, at the time, we we're going to move to Idaho. And it's like, I don't know how I'm going to search for her there, you know, but I, I'm just leaving that in your hands. I know, I know the dream. I know it's real. And I'll leave that in your hands. And uh, the next day, um, we saw, we were getting ready to go to town. You were just a little kid. You probably don't remember, do you? And we saw a taxi cab going down the road, slowing down, looking for like addresses, and I could see like two little ladies in the back with gray hair. You know, I didn't think anything of it, and I, but my thought was, well, somebody must have some money to take a taxi cab clear out here. We were out in the country, and so uh, we went to town, came home probably nine o'clock that night, and uh, got a phone call from my grandmother, and she could see our. We live next door. She could see what goes on in our house. See the headlights, you know, come in. And she said, uh, there's been a terrible thing happening in the family. And I'm like, well, my brother's a truck driver. He probably had a wreck and got killed or, you know, something horrible happened because grandma, it, it sounded terrible. And she said, uh, your, your dad's going to be right over. So, oh boy, you know, brace yourself. So uh, dad comes up driving. He gets out the car. He looks real somber, like somebody died, you know. But it wasn't him or grandma, right? And uh, he hands me this piece of paper. He says, uh, your mom, your mom was here today looking for you. And uh, Elvin had, and had her, her uh, phone number on there. And it was all I could do to refrain from doing a happy dance <laughs> in front of him because I, I knew how much he still hated her. And it's like, it was like there was this big angel with a sword <laughs> Ready to strike him down if he didn't do that. I mean, that's that was the expression on his face. Like, I have to do this. I don't want to do this, but here, you know. And he went back home. I went in the house, did a little happy dance in there. Called her on the phone. She answered, told her who I was, and uh, I said, can, "Can I come over and see you?" Yeah. And it turns out she was living in a Fresno hotel. Or, yeah, Fresno Hotel, if anybody knows where that at, it's kind of the, not the best part of town. And she was on uh, uh, like a social security disability or something like that. And uh, she was, uh, she had been, um, when, when dad divorced her, she had a, a nervous breakdown. And she went to try to live with her parents to kind of recover. And she had nothing, you know. And so uh, they didn't. She had had a sister going through similar things that was in there at the time. Said, "No, we we can't have you here." So they 
committed her to the uh, mental institution in Stockton, California, and went, uh, underwent, uh, I think it was something like 39 shot treatment therapies to help her. And what, what, what it ended up, they just erased the memory of her children that was tormenting her, that she could, couldn't see her three kids again. And uh, so they fried her brain enough where she forgot. And uh, so there, she said one Saturday, there was a, uh, she got one of her friends, she went out to breakfast, you know, walk, go down south, go to a little restaurant. And, and on her way there, an old man with white hair and a white beard came up and said, I know you, you're my mother. And uh, when he said that, her memory of her children came back. And she thought of me. She wanted to go find me. So she got a friend with her, and they got a taxi cab and went out in the country there to the last known address, which is right next door to where I was at. Come to find out she was living about within a mile of where I'd been working down there in California. And uh, we had her out to my brother's house, and she got to see the spouses of her three children and all her grandchildren. <laughs> that she would have. And uh, we're all serving the Lord, all raising our children to serve the Lord. And I looked it over her in the middle of all this and I saw the same look that I saw in the dream. She had the same look on her face. Now she was, because of all the shock therapy and all the things that happened to her life, the stresses and everything, she was uh, paranoid, schizophrenic, on heavy medication, talking to other people, and yet the Lord broke through. He answered prayers. Uh, we found in her apartment later on when she died a, a note she'd written how she was trusting in Christ. And that's part of my testimony. That's something that I, I love to share. and I, That one I don't think I've ever done it without tears because it, it means so much. It was something that was a desire of my heart. It was totally out of my control. I needed God to help. And he did. He did it. <clears throat> Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, like the song. Praise God. He gives us lots of reason to praise him, didn't he? Over and over. He'll do things that out of control for us, but they're in his control, and he can do it. He's the one who brings things to pass. So back to John. Uh, we got what we're at for 39.42. Okay, I think I read that. Now they're believing because they've heard from him. Let's go to John 7. Uh, 14. Not until halfway through the festival did Jesus go up to the temple courts and begin to teach. The Jews were amazed and asked, how did this man get such learning having never been taught without having been taught? Jesus answered, my teaching is not my own. It comes from the one who sent me. Anyone who chooses to do the will of God will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. Whoever speaks on his own, does so to gain personal glory, and he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is a man of truth. There is nothing false about him. So he's really, uh, this goes along with um, the whole idea of, of, of worshiping God in spirit and in truth, and that Jesus tell them that this teaching he's given them, it's not his own. It's and anyone who chooses to do the will of God We'll find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak of my own. And so we often, you know, I, I hear little kids asking, how, how do we know this is all real? How do we know it's true? Well, here's an answer right here. If you will do God's will, you're going to find out these things are true. You'll find out. You've got to live it out. You'll find, yeah, this is true. First Timothy 1, uh, 3 as I urged you when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus so that you may command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer or to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. Such things promote controversial speculations rather than advancing God's work, which is by faith. 
And so, so here we have, if you look at this, with this what's all going on in Samaria, uh, so many false teachings there, uh, and, and even in Jerusalem, how they were trying to live to the letter of the law, yet they missed the whole thing of mercy. And all, a lot of things we see in our time that only promote controversial speculation rather than advancing the work of God. And the work of God is by faith. So he goes on to say, the goal of this command, so this is, this is the result that will happen in your life if, if you allow the commands of God to be lived out in your life. So the goal of this command is love, which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Some have departed from these and have turned to meaningless talk. They want to be teachers of the law, but they do not know what they're talking about and what they so confidently affirm. It's not about confidence. It's about truth. And so as we would walk out uh, the will of God, we read the scripture, we, put it, we give it feet, the goal of that command will bring out and cause on us to have love and how, where does that love come from? A pure heart and a good conscience. Out of that, and a sincere faith. And that's what we want. That's, this is the kind of stuff where we can worship God in spirit and in truth. That's what he has for us. And so uh, I, I will leave you, that with you today to think about it and to think about uh, how God has worked so many things in your own lives and pray that he will give you opportunity to share with the other people. And, and you can be like the woman at the well. That, you know, we don't always know the exact scriptures to take them to, and yet we can take them to Jesus. He knows what to do with people. He'll, he'll answer with those things in their heart that they've wondered about, that's bothered them, that they've had no answers for, and he can settle those things. He has something far greater. He's got eternal life. He has living water that he wants willing out of us speaking. Lord, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you that uh, your words bring life to us. Lord, and your spirit within us, you come in and dwell in us. It is a well of water, and it springs up to eternal life. And Lord, the, the food you give us to eat, to, to do your will, Lord, and to finish the work, to help encourage others to, uh, to follow you, to maybe repent, maybe turn back to you even. Lord, but to, to help in the work that you have, to finish your work. Lord, that we would be uh, good laborers and not like the, like, like the ones of the uh, parable of talent where they just hid it under, a, under the bed or hid it in the ground and did nothing with it. Lord, you've given us some great things. You've given us a testimony of what you've done in our lives. You've given us the scripture. Help us to be wise stewards of this and to tell others about you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.